You know, one of my uh, favorite lines, of, one of my favorite quotation lines, it's attributed to Dietrich Bonhoeffer. I have no idea whether he really said this, but it's a great line. Gratitude is the beginning of joy. And so before we begin today, you know, there are things that I, uh, that's a hard thing for me. I, I, I work on gratitude, but I'm German-Irish, and I really prefer to be miserable. So, <laughs> but I have, been, I have been working on it, and, and I want to exercise that today. Uh, you know, uh, this conference would not exist without uh, Steph and, and Tim Bush, and, and uh, I think we should be so grateful to them for bringing it into existence. And of course, uh, John Meyer and Kathleen Ojeda have done just a fabulous job over the years to make this work. Also, think about the speakers. I mean, think about the guy that just introduced me. I mean, Father Spitzer is just an absolute home run, not simply as an MC, uh, but as a, as a speaker and an intellectual. And finally to you, I mean, this thing works because you come and you become friends and you share that friendship and feed it back. So I also want to thank you for the effort that you've made to be here and the contributions you've made. And I sincerely mean that. It's not simply because I urgently want you to like me. <laughs> so I'll start with, uh, you know, one of, one of Quentin Tarantino's favorite films, and I mean this seriously, is the 1975 film Switchblade Sisters. He said that on late night TV. He said it again in an interview with the New York Times Sunday Magazine. And if you have any doubts, just type in the words Quentin Tarantino, Switchblade Sisters, on YouTube. You'll find a collection of video clips with Quentin reading enthusiastically from the script. Now, Switchblade Sisters is one of the most idiotically bad movies ever made. And you can trust me on this because I wrote it. Uh, <laughs> both, both the story and the screenplay. I started my career in the early 70s. Uh, I was a writer and storyteller, and I did that and made a living at it uh, for six or seven years. Obviously, I've made a couple of modest course corrections in my uh, <laughs> career. Uh, but I still might tell a story or two later in these brief remarks. The job of the guy, though, who fills this particular session on the confer conference agenda is to revisit and confirm what we've learned and heard over the past three days. In other words, to make some overall sense of it. And I want to do that by talking about the vocation that most of us here today share, the lay vocation and what it means. A dozen or so years ago, a friend of mine uh, gave me a little wooden plaque for my office. I've had it on my bookshelf ever since. I stare at it every day. And on it are carved these words. It is as bad as you think, and they are out to get you. <laughs> now. The friend who gave it to me is also my former boss, a Capuchin Franciscan by the name of Charles Chaput. The Archbishop has a vivid, one might almost say devilish, sense of humor, and he gave it to me as a joke. And of course, it is a joke, but there are days now when it's not so funny anymore. This is a complicated time for American Catholics, and our problems as a church come in two distinct categories, external and internal. I'll get to our internal issues in a moment. But our main external problem is the canyon that exists between the abstract ideal America we often picture in our heads and the real America we actually live in today. The country we were six decades ago and the country we are now are two very different creatures, similar on the surface, different underneath. And one of the newest and weirdest struggles in our culture, maybe the jugular culture right now, is over who and what a human being is. It's at the heart of all our battles over sexual practice and morality. And the reason is that there's a deep streak of radical individualism in the American personality. And along with it goes a resentment of any constraints on our will to own and reinvent ourselves. We've heard this as a theme throughout this conference. So for example, if the church says a man can't be a woman or have sex with whomever, whenever, and however he wants, or a woman can't have as many, as, as many abortions as she wants, then the church is obviously an agent of repression, and she needs to shut up or be muzzled. And that explains, at least in part, the constant religious freedom battles we now face. It explains the toxic nature of our politics, which feeds our social fragmentation which then, sooner or later, 
always feeds authoritarianism. And of course, it also explains why we faithful Catholics, we're all in this together, uh, need to be culturally and politically engaged. Now, the stuff I've just said can sound pretty dark, but I think it's the opposite. I think it's simply the truth. And the truth really does make us free. Not comfortable, not always happy, but, but at least free from our illusions, free to see the world as it really is. It's a fact and an important fact that there's still a great deal of good in our nation and we need to fight for it. But it's also a fact that Catholics have never entirely been welcome in this country because of its Puritan and Enlightenment roots. I say Puritan roots rather than just Protestant roots for a reason. The Puritans were America's first colonists and they left a lasting mark on its character. And they were a pretty intense group of people kind of a human cocktail of zealous piety and equally zealous intolerance. Eric Vogelin, uh, whom Aaron, I think, quoted uh, last night in his comments, or at least today in an earlier session that we had uh, on the side, Eric Vogelin, the great political philosopher uh, who fled Nazi Ger Germany, described the P Puritans as the extremist Gnostic wing of the larger Calvinist reform. They had a particular hostility for Catholics, and by Catholics, both then and now, I mean the kind of Catholics who take their faith seriously, who love the church, and try to live what she teaches as a rule of life in a way that materially shapes the world, which after all is the whole point of discipleship. Now my point is simply this. The cost of joining the American mainstream has been very high for American Catholics, bleaching out many of the things that define us as believers. And while that's distressing, it's not all bad. It reminds us, as believers, that our real home in this world, our moderate magistra, our mother and teacher, is the church. And of course, that brings us to our internal problems. Georges Bernanos, the great French Catholic writer of the last century, described the church as one vast transport car company carrying people to heaven except it's one that has a lot of train wrecks. <laughs> Le left to her human management, he said, she tends to end up as a huge pile of overturned locomotives and burned out carriages. The thing that saves her from total disaster is her saints. And by saints, he meant much more than just the holy men and women whose names we all know and whose paintings can often seem saccharine in their piety or alien in their unreality. He meant the little people the saints next door, the everyday faithful believers who love God and love the church, not just when it's easy, but when it's hard, not just when it's socially acceptable, when it's not, which again is where we are now. And it isn't pleasant because so many of us thought we were a vital part of our national identity, a vital part of our national purpose. We thought we mattered. And yet now, along with a whole lot of other faithful Christians, we're being shed like a dead skin in a culture indifferent to God. So it's right to be frustrated, and it's certainly right to be angry. But our energy needs to focus on building up the church rather than whining in our foxholes. It's easy for us to forget that the church has always been in crisis. She always needs reform. Things like peace, purity, and unity in the church are aberrations in her temporal life, not the standard. And the reason for that is brutally simple. She's inhabited and led by sinners. In high school, I had the privilege of learning a few years of classical Greek from a couple of really terrific uh, priests. They were great teachers, and they gave me a lifelong interest in words and their roots. There's a verb in ancient Greek Crenine, which means to decide, and a noun, krisis, which means decision. Now, the Greek word krisis is the root of our English word crisis. And in a sense, that's what each of our lives is, a series of crises, one krisis or decision after another, determining the kind of person we become. Here's why that matters. The task of living an authentic lay vocation begins or ends with the central crisis facing each of us, which is not out there in the world, 
in the turmoil of our culture, but in here, in the conscience and will of every one of us. It involves the decision in each of our hearts to stay in the church or to leave her, to stand with the church or slip away, to believe what she teaches or not. Every person ends up worshiping some kind of God that orders his or her life. That includes every atheist. There are no exceptions. Sooner or later, consciously or unconsciously, we all choose. Joshua put the God question to the tribes of Israel very directly in Joshua chapter 24, verse 15, when he said, choose this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now, I think most of us here today want to do the same. So with that out of the way, let's talk specifically about the lay vocation. Graham Greene once said that, uh, I think the quote goes this way, behind the complicated details of the world stand the simplicities. The good news about living the lay vocation is that it's actually pretty simple. Anybody can do it. The not so good news is that it can be hard and take a long time. The reason it's hard is because it involves changing ourselves. Most of us don't really want to do that. The reason it takes a long time is because our appetites, our fears, and our habits are much harder to rewire than any church structure or any government committee. And every vocation, lay or otherwise, is a lifetime's work. But it can be done, and when it's done, interesting things happen. So let me tell you a story, and it's not going to be Quentin, Quentin, Quentin Tarantino. Uh, it's a true story, and it involves a woman friend that I admire very much. Once upon a time, there was a girl named Ellie. That wasn't her real name, but it's close enough. Ellie was young. She lived in Wisconsin. She fell in love with a boy, a nice boy, who was a couple of years older than she. They decided to run away to the West Coast and build a life together, which they did. But of course, it's hard to build a home when you and your husband, your, you and your boyfriend, are staying with his brother. You don't have any money. You don't have a job, and you turn out to be pregnant, which she was. So Ellie had a problem. She felt she couldn't go home pregnant, and the other option was eliminating the pregnancy problem at its source. But one afternoon, she saw a TV program, a talk show, featuring another young woman just a few years older than herself. This particular woman had two adopted siblings, and she was talking about how babies develop in the womb and why adoption is really such a good choice. So Ellie tracked her down and called her on the phone. She asked a lot of questions about adoption, and at the end of the conversation, point blank, she asked the woman if she'd be willing to adopt the baby that she, Ellie, was carrying, and the woman said yes. Now, this particular woman had very little money but a very persuasive personality. The Catholic OBGYN who delivered the baby and cared for Ellie charged no money. And he also paid for one of Ellie's two nights in the hospital from his own pocket. The woman attorney who handled the adoption ensured the proper legal and ensured the proper le legalities, also a Catholic, charged nothing but the court filing fees. And Ellie herself wanted no money. Now that sounds implausible today, but it happened. She never asked for a dime. She wanted the best for her child, and she wanted a chance to start over for herself. Nothing more. She handed her baby, a boy, to his adoptive mother on the night he was born, and then she disappeared from this particular story permanently just a few days later. But of course, the story itself continues. That baby grew up, was very handsome, extremely bright, and also a boatload of worries and problems. The boy made some very bad choices that, had led to, that led to some very bad results. He lived on the streets for months at a time. But his mother, the woman who had adopted him, uh, never quit on him. She never stopped believing, him, believing in him. She never stopped loving him. She never stopped praying for him. And little by little, over time, he changed. He made better choices. He cleaned up his life. Now today, he's a civil engineer right here in California, running an office of other engineers with his own two children and a very beautiful and very Catholic wife from Colombia, 
which simply proves that God may take his time, and he has some very weird twists in his story development, but he's always good. Now, everything I've just said is actually a chapter in another much larger tale that I'll save for another time. It's enough to say that this woman friend of mine, this adoptive mother, spent 49 years working in the pro-life trenches and hundreds of hours with her best friend Gail on pro-life counseling and referral lines. She founded or co-founded 11 pro-life clinics, ran a Right to Life League with 90,000 members, and volunteered in Special Olympics for 30 years. And on the side, in her spare time, uh, she raised four kids, including a son with Down syndrome, taught full time, earned her master's degree at night, and uh, incidentally managed the anxieties of an exceptionally difficult husband. I know all this from close observation because the, that adopted boy that I mentioned is my son, a man whom I love a lot uh, and take an immense pride in, and I've shared a bedroom with his mother for 52 years. Now this friend, this very intimate friend is my wife, is, is Sue Ann, who's in the audience somewhere, and we're married in case that needed clearing up. <laughs> uh, so what's the point in sharing these very personal details? Okay, the lesson in my story is not that it's unique, but precisely the opposite because it's not. The pro-life movement survived half a century of malice and setbacks because it's filled with hundreds of thousands of good people with other such stories invisible, unrecorded stories of love and sacrifice that are far more demanding than anything I could share. And we need to hear those stories and honor them because they teach us what it really means to be human. You know, Augustine said that being faithful in little things is a big thing. Being faithful is a big thing because every little unseen act of fidelity we do for the dignity of the unborn, the disabled, and the suffering creates a stream filled with the water of life. And each of those streams flows into the river of God's goodness and truth, a river that over time, and no matter how long it takes, wears down the hardest stone and cuts through even very bad laws. Now this is the sixth or seventh time I've been to a Napa summer conference. Every year is better. Every year is a blessing. But as I was finishing my thoughts for today, I was struck by the links uh, that the theme last year and this year shared in one organic message. Last year's conference theme was all things made new from Revelation chapter 20, verse 5. And he who sat upon the throne said, behold, I make all things new. So. How does God renew the world? Well, of course, he does it through us. And how do we do it despite all our weaknesses and sins? Well, we do it in the only way possible, by seeking, loving, and following God's Son, Jesus Christ, who himself in John chapter 14, verse 6, is the way, the truth, and the life. We do it by giving ourselves, uh, giving ourselves to Jesus Christ with everything we are and everything we have and receiving everything and more in return. As the gospel says, no one comes to the Father except through him. You know, when we look at the speakers this year from Mary Hassan, Jeff Cavins, Jessica Murdoch, and Sister Mary Mara Stella, to Carl Truman, Chris Stefanik, Monsignor Shea, Dan Lipinski, and Arthur Brooks, they've all been extraordinary, every one of them. I can't name them all or we'd be here all night. But the talk I want to underline in a special way as we draw to the close of these days, the one that we need to remember, <clears throat> whatever happens in the coming year, is Father Roger Landry's great reflection on the power of the powerless. None of us is ever powerless. We all always have the power to say no to a lie, to refuse to live a lie, and to live instead in the light of truth, no matter what it costs. Another quote from Augustine that I love is that people are always complaining about the evil and the darkness of the times. But he also said, we are the times. We make the times. And if we don't work to make the times better wherever God puts us and with whatever talent God gives us, 
then the times will make us worse. So we need to rid ourselves of the idea that we can't make a difference because we're just ordinary believers. There are no ordinary lay people because there are no ordinary Christians. There's nothing ordinary about the sacrament of baptism. It's the sacrament that undergirds the entire church, and it makes every one of us a disciple and missionary. Lecturing or volunteering in social ministries or serving on a parish council or joining a good lay apostolate or movement or supporting it with our resources. All of these things are beautiful ways of expressing our Catholic discipleship as laypersons. But in the end, our real work is out there, out in the world. That's our missionary field. And it's the little things and simple friendships that emerge naturally from being absorbed in a love of God that imprint themselves intimately on the lives of other people. And any one of us can do these things. I'll end with just a quick uh, final thought. You know, midway in the Lord of the Rings trilogy, one of the characters says, one of the main characters says, ours is but a small matter in the great deeds of our time. I've never forgotten that line. Ours is but a small matter in the great deeds of our time. Of course, the wonderful irony in those words <clears throat> is that the whole trilogy, the whole titanic struggle between good and evil that J.R.R. Tolkien writes about in his story hinges on these, <laughs> these two small, unimpressive, unimportant topic, the hobbits who refuse to abandon their task. They just do their job. They don't quit even when it seems hopeless to keep going. The point is this, whether we're a mother or father, a secretary or mechanic, a teacher, tailor, or candlestick maker, or the CEO of a Fortune 100 company, the lay vocation remains the same, using the raw material of our circumstances to give glory to God and to help other people share in his redemption through the witness of our lives. If we just do that, We've done what we were made for. And the world and the church will be better for it. Thanks very much.